This is implanting the system. So the first is decide if you're a surgeon or not. If you're not a surgeon, then don't do this by yourself, number one. Maybe do it with a surgeon, but don't do it by yourself. That's the know thyself part. Um, if you're not a surgeon and you're doing trials, you need to have a plan for who your surgeon is. You need to work with them. They need, you need to know what he or she wants before you, for the, from the trial. And you need to be a good citizen with your colleague and deliver them a perfectly selected patient with all the details they, knew, they, they need for implantation. If you are a surgeon, then let's pay attention to this part and talk about what you do next. You need to know your comfort, your limitations, your interests, your motivations, your availability for complications, all these things about this um, to, before you think about that. So it, it's a big deal. It's a big commitment when you put a system in someone. Because a surgical site infection is considered yours for how long? Anybody know? 12 months it's your complication. So 11 months after you've done your surgery, the patient comes up with an infection, that's yours. So just remember, it's still yours. <laughs> um, so implantation can be lots of people. It could be the pain doctor, it can be a neurosurgeon, it can be a spine-oriented spine uh, orthopedic surgeon. And then you can put in percutaneous leads or paddle leads. There are practices that always do one thing. Like I certainly know practices that everybody gets a paddle lead afterwards, which is a more invasive procedure with no current data to say it's better. There, is old, there are old data that show paddle leads require less energy and move less. That's old data. Um, and then recovery. There's different recovery periods. It's about two weeks to get past the early phase. It's two months to get things kind of healed up so that you're in the, the low risk, or much lower risk, and up to 12 months for, like I said, the deep infection being considered to be a surgical site infection. The risks include surgery, surgical things like infection, bleeding, et cetera, from surgery, lead migration, device malfunction and lead fracture, pain at the device the, at the site of the IPG, and there's a whole bunch of et cetera's that occasionally will come up. So the goals for the implant are to mimic or improve upon the trial placement. You want the, the leads to be well anchored. This has completely changed in my time of being an implanter. So it used to be there's like little silastic sheaths and you tied down with suture, not too tight that you're gonna damage the lead, but not so loose that it would move somewhere right in the, the sweet spot, which is why there was so much lead migration. You want the device correct, correctly connected, implanted in a comfortable and functional position. It didn't used to be that everything had a little click, 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 click when you tightened enough. It used to be you tightened just that right amount, and occasionally it wasn't the right amount. I've seen patients from other people come back with an IPG sitting here and two leads sitting next to it. Like, oh, that's really handy. <laughs> you need to make sure those are connected well. No, you want no bleeding or infection, a smooth post-op recovery. Um, you want to make sure that the infection risk is, is minimal as long-term as possible. And um, you want this to lay the groundwork for long-term sustained benefit for your patient in terms of pain and function both. So you should have a pre-op checklist, which again, look, this little committee has a list of pre-op checklists, which is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to read all this to you. Those documents are available to you to, to look up, but it's straightforward stuff you should think about. Make sure you have everything you need to get going. So my version of that is before ending the OR, you yourself personally re review the details of the trial, what your needle entry was, what your final position was, if there's any technical issues or anything else. Plan how many leads and where you put them. Decide on which IPG you're going to use and where you're going to place it. Um, make sure you know all the equipment you need and that the patient is medically optimized as determined by someone besides you that they're medically optimized. So I, if, especially if they're older or they have more medical conditions, I have them go see their primary care and say, hey, they're going to undergo a surgical procedure to make sure they're optimized for the surgical procedure. And that includes things like diabetes and anticoagulation, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people suggest culturing uh, for uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. I do that, and I decolonize if they have it. Um, and the other thing that's controversial is opioids. So some people taper folks off opioids. 
um, before the implant, saying that people do better if they're not on opioids when they get the implant. Other people say that there's emerging evidence that says once you have an effective stimulator in place, it's easier to tape the opioids then. So it's, there's no standard of care there. And then for those guidelines I showed you in the last talk, how you plan MAC anesthesia unless you can't. Um, the other thing is you want to minimize the patient's post-operative discomfort, so you want to be generous with your local anesthetic and think about multimodal analgesia to minimize their post-operative pain. And minimize infection with chlorhexidine showers, weight-based antibiotic dosing, and if it's a long, drawn-out case, redose the antibiotics. Positioning is super important to make it easy for you and sometimes to make the difference between non-success and success. So you don't want the patient listing off to one side. You want ideal positioning so you can see the, the space you're planning on going in and you have access to where you're planning on putting the device. For cervical cases, I use a cervical positioning device where the patient has a nice, comfortable way of having their head in place. I make sure their arms are not in the way so if they're up like this, you can't see in a lateral view. Think about all those things in advance. Definitely sterile prep and drape. I use Ioban. I, everybody double gloves who's going to be touching the field. And depending on where you are, it, that last step may sound ridiculous, but I learned when I moved to the University of Washington, I need to ask for fluoro early. Because <laughs> you want to be able to see what you're doing. Um, so you need to make your incision lower than where you intend to enter the epidural space to allow for the needle to move in a cephalad direction. Um, the length of decision, incision depends on the depth of the patient and also your anchoring technique that you're going to be using. Uh, be really be, be generous with local anesthetic. I use a mixture of lidocaine and bupivacaine with epinephrine. Um, and you want to carry the incision down to a depth where everything is firm, right above the inner spinous ligament. And you want to make, you dissect enough space to have space to put the anchors. So don't just go down, okay, I see it, I'm done, and then where you put the anchors. You need to have space to put those anchors nice and flat and down well. Make sure you have hemostasis before you start, and make sure you know where midline is. Sometimes you start with x-ray on what you think is midline, and you're making your, in the, your incision down like this, and the midline was still over here. So you need to make sure you're on midline when you get down there, you know where you are. Then for lead placement, lead placement, the principles are similar to during the trial. Pyramiding approach, advanced with control. Um, you have to plan for where you're going to anchor. So if you start your needle at the bottom part of your incision, then you're going to run out of places to anchor. Um, so you need to think about anchoring. Um, and if you can't, if you make incision first and then anchor, which is the pattern I've turned to, I used to do the other way around, and you can't get in and you can't get in, and you can't get in, then you're going to have to make a bigger incision or another incision. Um, <clears throat> anchoring, as I mentioned, has completely changed. Everybody has their own system. You should ask everybody to show you their anchor and tell them why they designed it that way and what's the advantage of their anchor. They're all some form of a mechanical anchor, um, and mechanical anchors are good. They, they hold the lead. They're not going to fail on you. They're less like, let me rephrase that. They're less likely to fail than your suturing technique. Um, so if I'm anchoring with traditional anchors, I say I make sure there's space for the snout of the anchor, th thread it as far as I can in, place uh, the non-absorbable sutures before I remove the needles, take the needles out, place the anchor, wrap the suture around, tighten down, imaging repeatedly to make sure I haven't done something silly with moving things. Um, and then. Uh, make sure the final position is really good, because you can still move it. You still have the incision open. If you, if you somewhere or another, you or somebody else has managed to, to move the lead, now is a good time to find out. Sometimes you can just loosen the, loosen the anchor, reinsert the stylet, be able to move it a little bit. Other times you have to take the anchor off and do a little bit of starting over, but you can, you can reposition now. Once you start closing, it's too late. So Boston Scientific has the Fixate device, which makes Suturing not necessary, you just click, click, ch -ch -ch, cut. It's quicker and easier, but it costs money. Um, Medtronic has the Inject bumpy, anchor, bumpy Anchor. So again, ask each rep, each company, about their anchors, how they work, what the advantage is, what, if there's any special details about them. And those are going to be changing all the time, trust me. Um, so some things I've seen happen on patients coming to see us. I've seen an anchor sitting there and then a loop of, of lead between the epidural space and the anchor. 
So to minimize that, your anchor needs to be as close to the epidural, put that snout in as far as you can. Bury that anchor as close to where it needs to be. Don't have space between the epidural space and your anchor. The, min the shorter that distance is, the less likely you're to get that loop with moving. You don't want the anchor at some, if this is the person's back, you don't want the anchor like this. It's not gonna work because it's gonna be able to move. You want it flat. You want to be laying flat and parallel to the spine. It's definitely harder in obese patients. If you're six, seven years in to get to where you're finding some, some tissue that isn't all soft and gushy, it's gonna be harder to anchor than if it's only a couple centimeters in. Bear that in mind. Uh, for the pocket, many different ways of doing pocket sites and many different variations of how to do this. Just know that pain at the IPG site does happen. It's less than 10%, but can be up to 10% in some populations. It's, it's usually single digit numbers, but it's real when it happens to your patients, unpleasant. And that can be because it's hitting the 12th rib, it can be because it's hitting the iliac crest, hitting the spinous process, it's at some weird angle, um, something else. The other things that happen, the, the IPG can get mobile. If you make your pocket too big, you can start flipping around. If the patient does something like my patient in Portland did, which was get up at the night to go to the bathroom, trip over the sleeping cat in the hallway, land on the doorknob, and pull the, just rip the IG, IPG inside the patient still, but out of its pocket now, and a new, whole new pocket created, um, that's not so good. That results in an ER visit for the patient with her huge flank hematoma, and IPG now nowhere where it's supposed to be. Once the hematoma resolved, we had to go back and, and do that again and, and train her cat to sleep somewhere else and her to turn the light on. Um, <clears throat> so think about the pocket. So I sometimes do a single incision and just push it off to the side if the patient has space for that and it's a small IPG. That does not work very well with a larger IPG. Um, I make a separate incision. I make it not too small because you want to stretch the skin out and distort everything to get it in. You want it to be exactly the right size. Um, and then use a sizer. Don't make the pocket any bigger than it needs to be. Make it a nice, snug fit with enough room to put the leads behind the device. Um, so really pay attention to that sizing. If you've made a separate incision, you're gonna to have to tunnel, and you tunnel from the back to the incision, and you make sure you put little loops at the back and a loop underneath the device. You need to have enough lead to be able to do that to allow patients to position and change without the leads pulling out, putting tension on the epidural space. Um, when you're tunneling, don't tunnel too superficially. I again have seen this with a patient coming to me like, I have this thing here and you can see like a red raised area where the, the leads are so close to the skin they're irritating the skin and coming through. That does not work. You wanna be deep, 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 not in the peritoneum, that's not so good, but somewhere reasonably deep. And then connect. Um, insert the leads. Make sure you have electrical continuity. Have your rep check, whatever way that they do to check. And then you tighten and make sure you're really secure. Clicks are good. And then closing. So I irrigate. I irrigate for two reasons. One is to make sure I'm not missing some bleeding thing. The other is to get rid of debris. Antibiotic is a plus minus. There's not great evidence that adds anything to add it. I now put vancomycin powder in the incisions. I think that's becoming more standard as we've gone forward. If it's been a little while, I put more local anesthetic to help with the initial postoperative pain control. And yet I close it tightly, leaving no dead space and closing really well. Um, I use interrupted uh, running, I, I actually I use running sutures at the skin. I use interrupted sutures deeply. Um, and some people use staples, there's other ways of closing. You just wanna make sure you close well. And I put Dermabon on, and I put an occlusive dressing on, which stays on until the next day. Lots of different ways of doing this, and ask your faculty how they do it, because everybody will do it somewhat differently. You can talk about it tomorrow. Post-operative, you, you need to give them some analgesics for the first few days. It is a surgical procedure. Don't overdo it. Um, Oral antibiotics for 24 hours. No good evidence beyond that is of any value, so I do 24 hours only. Um, I make sure that the person that the patient lives with looks at the incision, looks at the dressing that day, and then every day for the next two months. And maybe take some pictures on their device so they can compare and contrast. <clears throat> 
So you can pay attention. So if it starts to get red or get looking funny, they let you know early, you can do much, much more than if they wait too long. So they need to pay attention so they can compare and contrast and see what's going on. In those NAC guidelines, there's a whole bunch about infection control, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but we can talk about as much as you want to other times. So I basically mentioned the main things, sterile technique, I'm making sure you treat remote infections, use antibiotics that are weight-based and appropriate, redose when you need to, no more than 24 hours of post-operative antibiotics. Those are the, the big things. And also know when your patient's at increased risk. They have a history of other surgical site infections. Be worried. The history of some other immunocompromise, be worried. Pay attention to this. I, just in the last few months, have seen a patient that came from elsewhere. She had a history of four prior surgical site infections, infected spinal cord stimulator, taken out. A year later, goes back, gets reimplanted. It's now nine months out, and she clearly has surgical site infection, which was being ignored. I, Ultrasounded in clinic, I could see like a fluid collection, sucked it off, that did not look good, and she had to have an explant. So pay attention to that history, it's really important. If they're a high risk patient, they're gonna probably stay a high risk patient. Um, so there's a whole bunch of steps to remember. It's important to have them in your head so you don't forget something. I'm gonna do this, 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 this. If you wanna write it down, have a checklist, go through it mentally in your head, and make sure that you basically do the same steps every time. You might have individual variations in how you did each step, but all the steps should be for every single patient. Um, and practice, practice, practice. As I, as I say to our fellows, the operating room is not the place to learn to tie sutures or to throw a suture. <coughs> the operating room is a place to gain experience with actually doing it after you know how to do it on your own. Um, and to collaborate. Know when this is beyond my abilities. Know when to say no. You're not a weak person. You're not a bad doctor when you send the patient on to someone else. So bear that in mind. And it can be a lot of fun. So this is me with a whole bunch of fellows in different locations. It's really fun to be in the operating room. It's fun to do this. The, there's pleasure in doing procedures. We all know there, or else we wouldn't be sitting here. But it also is life-changing for your patient. So thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Yes? What are your thoughts on patients who are chronically anticoagulated? So the easy question of what are your thoughts about patients who are chronically anticoagulated? So it definitely changes the risk-benefit ratio for, for the procedure. Um, I always, before interrupting anticoagulation, want to have a documented interaction with the prescriber of the anticoagulation, number one. Number two, they need to be able to be off their anticoagulation for the trial, for the entire time the leads are in place, um, not just for the insertion, the entire time the leads are in place and 24 hours afterwards. Every time, always, or people will testify against you if your patient gets an epidural hematoma. I promise. For implant, they need to be, have normal anticoagulation status and need to keep that for at least a few days afterwards. And then the patient needs to know that going forward, they are increased risk for an epidural hematoma forever, as long as they're on the anticoagulation, period. That's the truth. It, it's not the same as it is during those high risk things, but it's not zero. I too have placed these for angina on patients who are anticoagulated and I had to interrupt their anticoagulation for that, which they thankfully did fine with, with the help of the cardiologist. But then I taught, part of my discussion when we were signing the consent was your increased risk for getting a hematoma here. So I really think about, about that for the long term too. Not just the getting through the, the two steps, but also long term. And there's not a right answer and everybody will have a different way of working this. Excellent question. Any other questions? Okay, good. We have a little bit of a break, and then we're going to find out what the cadaver is like in the anatomy so I can try to do a stimulator. Thank you. <laughs>